Dr. Beth Neary, who I have seen uh, numerous times. She's a pediatrician, and she's with um, Wisconsin Environmental Health Network, and we appreciate her willingness to drive all the way up from Madison to give this presentation today. So let's welcome Dr. Neary. Thank you, Dean. So, well, let's get started. So, I always like to do an outline because I'd like you to know where this talk is going to go. So, first I'm going to talk about what are PFAS, their purpose, health consequences, our exposure, why regulation is so important, and how can we protect ourselves while we wait for the regulation to happen, and are there any good, is there any good news on the horizon? So, okay, I'm not going to take you back to chemistry class, but this is the chemical structure of the backbone of PFAS. So it has the carbon links there. And why that's important to know is people will often talk about short chain and long chain. It's related to the number of carbons that are in there. And what's interesting about this is the carbon-fluorine bond is an incredibly strong bond, which gives it its beneficial properties, but it also gives it its negative properties of the PFAS. Um, it does not exist in nature. It was created in a lab, and it's very hard to break this bond. So what are these things? Well, they're re referred to as PFAS because it's such a long word to say. So I had to change the slide. It said 9,000. Now I'm up to 12,000 in this class. So it's actually excellent at repelling dirt, grease, and water. So it has a lot of wonderful purposes. It's very stable at, they are very stable at high temperatures. So let's talk about what products actually contain PFAS. So food contact surfaces like your hamburger wrappers, the inside of your microwave popcorn bag, um, sometimes a pizza box. If it has a slick interior, it's got PFAS. Um, the stain repellents in your carpets, stain repellents in your furniture, water-resistant clothes, ski wax. Uh, firefighting foam, you're all aware of that, living in this area. Personal care products, anything from dental floss to cosmetics to tampons. Now, this, the next category, except for artificial turf, that's not necessary, but the next category, metal plating and wire insulation, those are what they call, you'll often hear referred to as essential uses of PFAS. So these other things are really not essential, and I mean, we really can eliminate them. So what's the problem with PFAS? It's persistent in the environment and very mobile. It bioaccumulates in organisms anything from fish to humans, which means it accumulates over time and it's hard to get it out of the body. In fact, in the human body, there isn't really a way uh, to remove it once it's in the body. Um, it's toxic at extremely low concentrations, parts per trillion. We don't measure anything else in parts per trillion. And it's linked to many health problems that I'm going to talk about. Just to put this in perspective, what's a part per trillion? It's a drop of water in 20 Olympic swimming pools. So this is this concept that it's really important for you to understand long chain versus short chain. And I'm not going to send you through chemistry class again here, but there's two classes. There's the carboxylic acids and there's the sulfuric, sulfuric acids. And depending on which one, that's where you'll hear some overlap in a long, long chain and a short chain. Okay, back to the chemical structure. And like I said, the long chain have more carbons in it. The shorter chains have less carbons. These are five that I want you to know about, actually six, <laughs> um, because there's 12,000, but the vast majority are going to be these PFOS chemicals. And in the, on the left-hand side is the long chain. So there's the PFOA, and its other name is often called C8. And that was the main chemical in Teflon, and it was actually discontinued by DuPont in 2015. And the next one on the category there is the PFOS, that was the key ingredient in Scotchgard. Again, it was discontinued 
but they are still a problem because they persist. So those are the two you're gonna hear the most about. The next two long chain ones are gonna be the PFX HXS, which is the one in the firefighting foam, and then this other one, PFNA. Now on the other side is the short chain. So PFOA went out of production, so what they did is made a replacement PFOS, and that's called Gen X, and it also has another name, just to confuse us, the HPODA. <clears throat> it's a shorter chain, and we'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. And then the same for PFBS, which only has four carbons. So the advantage of a shorter chain is it doesn't hang around as long, and it doesn't bioaccumulate as much. And the problem is uh, it still has, from the latest research, the health effects. So why are PFOA and PFAS still a problem, even though they were phased out? Well, they persist in the environment. They can move easily through soil and water. They're found in wastewater sludge, and they can bioaccumulate in animals, fish, and humans. And we'll hear more about fish, and I'm very excited to hear your talk on that. So here's a little bit of the history of PFAS. So if we go back here, this is a busy slide, but I'll walk you through a few key points. If we go back here, it was started in the 30s and the 40s by DuPont. What I want you to get from this slide is how early they knew there were health effects and that they really didn't reveal that. So if you look at 1978, there were some unpublished studies of adverse effects of PFOA in monkeys. And in 1980, they were noticing it in the serum of their workers. There was a cancer study in rats in 1987, and not listed on here exactly, but they did note that some of the women who were pregnant and worked in the plant had a higher incidence of children with birth defects. So the data has been around for a while. So what happened to DuPont? Well, I hope you've read or watched the movie um, about this, but this, is, uh, this was an article from the New York Times about Rob Billow. So his grandmother lived in West Virginia near uh, the DuPont plant, and um, there was a farmer that lived near her whose uh, almost his entire herd of cattle died, many of them from tumors. And he had a theory that it was related to this plant up the road because his cattle drank the water. Um, and she said, well, let me get in touch with my, uh, my, nep my grandson, who's a lawyer. So that's her grandson, and he took on the case. And believe it or not, he actually won the case. Now, as a physician, one of the thing, best things that came out of this case was a great epidemiologic study. It's called the C8 study. And what happened was 70,000 people in that community signed up for this study, and it's what they call a prospective study. So you look at people going forward. Um, legally, we couldn't say to people, here, drink this PFAS and we'll see what happens to you, but that's what the study actually gave us. And what came out of this study, and if you haven't seen the movie, you should see Dark Waters, it's the story of it. We found these diseases, kidney cancer, testicular uh, cancer, kid, uh, ulcerative colitis, thyroid disease, elevated cholesterol, and then uh, hypertension in pregnancy. And this is the exact, these are the exact diseases that they were finding in lab an animals, so it was consistent. So here's some more health effects that we've learned about. It can affect cognitive development in children. Uh, it can affect fetal and infant growth. One that concerns me as a pediatrician is the decreased antibody response. So they did some studies of children who were receiving their diphtheria tetanus vaccine and their measles vaccine, and they found that they didn't respond as well. In other words, after you have a vaccine, your antibody level should go up, and theirs were not going up as high in children that had elevated PFOS in their blood. And I won't read the rest of them, but... I'll tell you about a new study very, there at the end. So we know it's impairing the thyroid function, but a new study that just came out this week from Mount Sinai, they actually linked it to thyroid cancer. So the issue with PFAS is 
It gets in the bloodstream, it attaches to a protein, and then it's carried to all the different organs and tissues. And as opposed to dioxin, dioxin actually only attaches to one receptor. PFOS can attach to multiple receptor, receptors. So it's a multi-system toxicant. So that's the endocrine system, just to show you all the different organs that it can have an impact on. And depending on the specific PFOS, it targets different organs. So um, this is a slide that shows that we all have it in our blood, but I want you to focus on that top line because that's important to see. So the PFOS, which is the one that's most prevalent and actually has been discontinued, you can see that when they've discontinued it, it actually has dropped in our blood, which is a good thing. So my, my, my mantra is we need to stop putting it into the environment. We can clean it up, but we have to stop putting it in also. So this is an interesting study because we were trying to learn, so where does the PFOS go? And it's a busy slide and I'm just going to walk you through a few of them. Look at the first one, PFBA. And remember how I told you that's one of the short chain ones, so there's a theory that it might not have detrimental effects. Well, you can see that it has a predilection for the lung. And then if you look at PFOS, it tends to go to the liver, which seems consistent because we know it has effects on cholesterol levels. Um, those are the only two I'm going to have you look at right now because I have another slide that I want to show you that short chain one, that PFBA. They did a study where they looked at levels of PFBA in the blood of people who were in the hospital during COVID. And what they found was a linear correlation. The higher the level of PFBA in the blood, the more severe your COVID uh, reaction was. So that's interesting to me. So short, ch short chain PFOS may not be the solution. So what puts you at greater risk? So fetus, infant, and children, they're always at a greater risk, whatever it is, whether it's dioxin, whether it's lead, just because they're smaller, they're more susceptible. Um, if you have underlying health conditions, Cultural practices, if you are somebody who consumes a lot of fish, for example, and there's PFOS in your fish, you're going to have a higher level in your blood. Um, certain occupations, if you work in the plant or you're a firefighter, and where you live if your water's contaminated. Because I'm a pediatrician, I need to emphasize this point of why children are always more susceptible. They have different absorption and metabolism. They are, all their organs are growing rapidly. They drink more water and more food in proportion to their body's size. And because they have a higher respiratory rate, if I have something in the air, and PFOS can go in the air, um, they're gonna get more of it because they breathe faster. And that's not just because they run around, they breathe faster at baseline. And they have a longer lifespan to accumulate this. What about firefighters? Well, they have the double whammy because the product is in their firefighting gear and it's also in the foam. Now the issue is how do doctors monitor for PFOS-related illnesses? This is a tough one. So as opposed to something like a salmonella outbreak, right? You know immediately, you have an outbreak, you're gonna have GI symptoms, you're gonna have diarrhea and vomiting. This, these are harder because it's over a longer term. However, um, we as physicians don't have a way to remove it from the body. So prevention is the most important thing here. Um, the National Academy of Science, Engineering, and Medicine came out with some clinical guidelines um, based on blood levels. And basically, what they're telling physicians is just to monitor more carefully for certain diseases, for thyroid disease, for certain cancers, and to watch cholesterol levels. So there's not a lot that we can actually do. So how are we exposed? Water, contaminated drinking water, food, fish, food packaging, through the air and through occupation. So what about PFAS and water in Wisconsin? So this is from the Environmental Working Group. This is a couple of years old. 
um, about the purple are military sites, because you know that living near a military base or an airport puts you at slightly higher risk because of the use of the firefighting foam. And the dark, bl uh, the dark blue are the um, sites where drinking water is contaminated. So if you look at Michigan and you look at New Jersey or North Carolina, you're like, wow, they're terrible. Nope, it's just that they looked. Maybe we haven't looked, right? So is it a problem in Wisconsin? Absolutely. All five municipal Wausau wells had elevated PFAS. We know problems in French Island, and you live close enough to know all about the Tycos plant here. So this is from the DNR. This is what I found on their website, the known PFAS sites as of 2022. Um, this is again from the Environmental Working Group, um, and it's potential sites of PFAS discharge in Wisconsin. So the orange is suspected uses, uh, the blue refers to airports, the purple is landfills, and green is sewage and waste treatment plants. You know, you know this, I'll just, that's an aerial photo of the um, Johnson Control site. But I'm gonna put a shout out to community advocates because I think community advocates are the ones who make all the difference in the world on any of these issues. So keep doing what you're doing. Okay, regulation is critical. So the EPA has recently proposed uh, new MCLs for six PFAS chemicals. And an MCL means a maximum contaminant level, and it's actually legally enforceable. It hasn't occurred yet. They are proposing this. But again, this is only going to be for municipal water supplies. Anybody who's on well water, you're on your own. So, And this is what they're uh, proposing as of this time. And again, I'm going to say cleanup is critical, but we have to stop the flow of PFAS into the environment. So how are we doing that? There are some states that are amazing taking the lead. They've banned PFAS in food packaging in California, New York, Washington, and Maine. Look at Minnesota, our neighbor. They are banning it in all these products within the next two years. Why aren't we doing that? I thought Wisconsin was the leader on environmental issues. Uh, even the federal government, the Department of Defense, is stopping using the AFFF um, in 2024. They're banning it in food packaging for the military. And then industries, believe it or not, have taken the lead. And there's a list there of some industries um, where you can feel more comfortable buying their products knowing that they have taken the lead. And, and I'll tell you, I, I read some um, information by Keen, who makes shoes and boots, and they've really taken the lead in trying to get under other industries to follow the lead. So it has to happen on many, many different levels. Okay, while we wait for the politicians to regulate, what can you do to minimize the impact? Okay, what can you do? First of all, you need to know, is PFAS in your drinking water? Is PFAS in your well? Um, cook with stainless steel, cast iron glass. I don't use Teflon. I, I, can, I can scrub a pan just effectively. I don't need it. Um, I avoid the nonstick. Avoid the food packaging. So eating actually less fast food is a good thing in many ways, um, but because it's also in the packaging. But I did hear that McDonald's and Burger King are going to start to take it out in the next couple of years. That's probably from consumer pressure more than anything. Um, avoid the microwave popcorn, limit your consumption of fish. Um, and this is a quote from the DNR website. It said, according to researchers, the main dietary source of PFAS is fish and shellfish. Now choose products like the carpets and things like that that don't contain PFAS, even dental floss. So here's a study I found um, where they actually looked at women um, who used um, Oral-B Glide, which has PFAS in it, and they actually had higher levels of PFAS in their blood. So they documented this. Therefore, I use ones that don't have it in it, such as Reach. <laughs> um, and if you want to know more products, I'm not going to go through the whole list, but there's a great website that you can go to for PFAS-free products. What about your water. What about filters? 
um, Duke did a great study in terms of what removes the PFAS from, from um, water. So reverse osmosis is the best, but of course that's expensive. It's about $40 a month to put that in your house. Um, the activated carbon filters do a pretty good job, about 75%. Um, and if, if you go to the store now, the hardware store, and you look at filters, a lot of them now will say remove PFAS, so you can look for that. The important thing is you have to change your filter frequently. And one of the issues with the short chain ones is they're short, one, short chain ones might sneak by on these filters. So that's a little problematic. Oops. And as you know, um, the F uh, maybe you don't know, but the FDA actually regulates bottled water. So there's regulations on how much lead can be in it and things like that, but there's no regulations for PFAS. So what do you do? There was a Johns Hopkins study of uh, all the PFAS in various forms of bottled water, and this is what they found, that water that was treated via the reverse osmosis really is the best. And if you buy bottled water at the store, it, it can say that. Usually if it's purified, it'll say, on the real small print, it'll say reverse osmosis. Um, but this was their findings. They found that the PFAS was lower in purified water versus spring water, um, and, but you can't be guaranteed that distilled water necessarily removes the PFAS. So what are ha what's happening in Wisconsin? I can't give you all negative news, right? So we did get some federal funding, which was wonderful. And uh, just this week, um, Governor Evers and the DNR announced $400, $402 million to improve drinking water quality for Wisconsinites. Uh, some of that's going to go for lead abatement in um, for lead service lines in uh, Milwaukee, which is wonderful too. And I just made a note that WASA is going to get money to clean up the PFAS in their municipal wells. So progress is happening. That's good. So I don't ever want to depress you. I want to make you more aware. And so I say that you can have an influence. Your power is in your connection. And you need to put pressure on your elected officials. And if you need more motivation, I recommend you read these two books, which are amazing. Paradise Falls is the story of Love Canal. And it was a housewife, Louise Gibbs, who was just so instrumental in uh, pushing for advocacy. And because of what she did, that started the super fund um, in the EPA. So she's just amazing. And then Paper Valley is a story about your area and how the PCBs were cleaned up. So um, thank you. These are people who shared their slides with me. And I'm going to put in one advertisement. Um, my group actually puts on an environmental health conference. And that will be on November 10th in Madison at the medical school. But you can sign on um, remotely, too. So go to our website at the Wisconsin Environmental Health Network. And one of our speakers is Graham Peasley, who is a professor at Notre Dame, who did um, many. Uh, he developed a, a way to see uh, how PFAS it shows up in products. So he worked on firefighting gear, and he worked on consumer products um, so that we know is PFAS there. So anyway, thank you for listening, and any questions? <laughs>